Hello and a warm welcome to our special program, Capital Beat. Hearing up first of the seven phases of Lok Sabha elections starting 19th of April. Major states which are going to polls are Assam, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, Uttarakhand. Uh, Rajasthan, say for example, has 12 seats up for grabs, UP 8, West Bengal 3, Uttarakhand 5, Arunachal 2, Tamil Nadu, all the 39 seats are up for grabs and the list is quite long. But what we're going to discuss is that how has the campaign been so far? What are the issues that the people uh, have been talking about and the issues that have mattered to the people? And what does the picture look like as far as the first phase of Lok Sabha elections is concerned? On the screen, you see uh, a very elaborate panel today joining us from different parts of the country. Uh, we have uh, Anil Sharma joining us from Rajasthan. So thank you so much for joining. He's a political commentator and senior journalist. We have uh, Girish Joshi who joins us uh, from Gujarat. Thank you so much, uh, Girish. He's a senior journalist and political commentator. Thank you so much. We have Vivek Desh Pandey who's joining us from Maharashtra, senior journalist and political commentator. Thank you so much. We have Kavita Murli Dharan who joins us from Tamil Nadu. She's a senior journalist and political commentator. Thank you so much. We have uh, TK Rajalakshmi who's a senior deputy editor from uh, the front line. Thank you so much. She's joining us from Delhi. And we have uh, Pushpraj Desh Pandey, who is the director of the Samrit Bharat Foundation. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Pushpraj, for joining. And I'll begin with Tamil Nadu because that's a maximum number of seats coming from Tamil Nadu, 39 seats. Kavita, how has the campaign been in Tamil Nadu? Because we've also seen uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. We've seen, we've seen the carpet bombing rallies by Stalin. And uh, uh, so how has the, what, what does the campaign look like in Tamil Nadu? What are the issues that have really mattered to the people and those issues which have really resonated on the ground. Uh, Tamil Nadu, I mean, every election is a is like festival for us. It's it's like carnival for us. And this election, it's 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 like no different. Uh, high energy campaigns. People are. I mean, I can even as I talk to you, I can hear the sounds in the background at my home. You know, so it's a last ditch effort by all the leaders to finish their to finish their campaigns. As you said, Prime Minister Modi had come here for some seven times altogether. Uh, Rahul Gandhi had visited us once. So it, uh, I mean, it's uh, very strange. In Tamil Nadu, the race is not for the first place, but for the second place. You know, it's it's almost a foregone conclusion that the DMK alliance is going to uh, win most of the seats. So the problem is, I mean, the question is, who is winning the second place? And BJP is very it's like really trying hard to push the narrative that it will, uh, it is likely to come second. But uh, I mean, it remains, they have kind of orchestrated their campaigns also in that way. For example, Annamalai said that ADMK will cease to exist after June 4. So that's how the, he uh, took the campaign over. So I think, uh, I mean, uh, on June 4, we'll know what's happening. But the campaign has been political. Uh, and there are, like, DMK has to take on against the BJP and the ADMK front. Last time it was not like the last time BJP and the ADMK were in alliance. So they and the DMK and it's the same with the ADMK. For some till till some period, I think the BJP and the ADMK were not like hitting out at each other. But as the election nears, as the campaign is coming to an end, I could see that there is a lot of exchange between the DMK uh, between the ADMK and the BJP. That's happening. Yeah. So the campaign but, has been. I think yeah. Right. So Kavita, as far as the issues are concerned, what are the kind of issues that have really resonated as far as Prime Minister is concerned, as far as Stalin is concerned, AIDMK is concerned. What are the issues which the people have really talked about? Are those the issues which matter to the people or they are the emotive issues which were discussed by and large? So one thing about Tamil Nadu, uh, uh, Nilu, is pe people don't go for emotive issues here. You can't, uh, I mean, why uh, uh, so, uh, something like Sanatana Dharma strikes a chord in North India and not in Tamil Nadu? I mean, because people relate more to livelihood issues, they relate more to issues like education, job opportunities, and you know, not to emotive issues. So uh, that is very clear here. So that's what uh, I think uh, Chief Minister's campaign was around uh, the livelihood issues, how the BJP is, you know, it's against the progressive schemes that has been introduced by the DMK. And between the, D between the ADMK and the BJP, it was more political about who will you know, about other, uh, I think the BJP was trying to exploit the fact that ADMK was not a consolidated 
single unit and they had two leaders uh, two former admk leaders on their side ttv dinakaran and open it selvam so they were it was more political they also worked around issues for example in vilupuram the admk candidate drove a bullock cart uh, during this campaign to just demonstrate uh, the people's angst against the price rise of petrol and diesel so those things were also happening so but mostly it was about price rise employment opportunities gst gst was uh, in coimbatore especially the dmk kept campaigning about the gst so these things were like happening yeah so now let me come to rajasthan anil uh, will give us a picture as to what is really happening in rajasthan is it uh, are we going to see a tough fight for bjp uh, Uh, we saw a few videos of bhajan lal sharma who is the chief minister where he is really urging the people to stay on and you know there is actually no crowd uh, visible and whatever little people are there they don't want to sit and listen to him there was a video which was doing the round just 3 days uh, back and me and girish were one on on one of the platforms we discussed this bit but uh, what is the political scenario in rajasthan 25 seats uh, is bjp really facing a tough challenge over there they are for the first time after 2014 you know in 2014 the slogan was acche din 2019 was nationalism but this time there's no issue as such and the issue which has taken over is agni veer it has become a very important issue in shekhawati region of rajasthan which is a belt of jats dark jats dominated basically so i'm finding that jats are consolidating along with them the uh, scsts and muslims obviously are behind now with the i uh, with the india alliance now i will not say congress because it's a uh, one seat they have given to cpim that seeker one seat they have given to rlp that's nagor and one seat they have given to bap that is uh, in travel belt of bansoda dungarpur so i think you know this time the score cannot be 250 for the first time after 10 years what we are sensing here in rajasthan is the score can be 25 20 and 5 or it can increase further but congress or india alliance will at least get more seats you know in comparison to last election that means even two will you know it's a 2% growth for them if they even win two seats and they're cutting down on two seats for mr modi from rajasthan and the kind of rush you talked about bajanlal bajanlal is the first time mla and first time chief minister he is getting no response frankly and with him you know there is a very strong uh, meena leader called kirori lal meena who is with bjp he is quite a known figure in rajasthan politics he himself i seen couple of his videos where he is urging people why so many so less people have att- are attending my rallies he is talking to them on the on, on on mic you know and there are the number of people are only 20 25 you know and he is one of the uh, their best bets to get uh, mina votes which are sts which are considered sts no no but so, anil you you've made an important point but does that mean that the ground is really shifting and it, it, and the sentiment is really not in favor of bjp uh, how as, would you read this as as far as today yes but not much i'll not say that uh, india alliance is going to win 25 out of 25 what i am saying the best chance for them is between 2 and 5 but yeah. five can go to seven i'll not be surprised but i'll be surprised if they don't get any seats i'll be very much surprised this time because the seats i can count on is churu where rahul kaswa who has shifted from bjp to congress is fighting it seems to be certain nagor where arman menibal from uh, rlp is fighting and uh, banswada dungarpur where uh, bab's candidate rajkumar roth is fighting these three mm-hmm. seats look to be very clean to us as of today but um, you know what happens on the on the, on the uh, counting day is depends on the public you know where the uh, because they are more intelligent than us but i think this time it's not going to be 25 uh, of zero it's uh, no chance in other right but i was very curious in knowing that what about the vasundhara factor what is vasundhara raje doing uh is she really helping the bjp or is there some kind of an understanding of i don't know how to call it but are the things being derailed for bjp from her end uh i mean uh, is she working uh, at the back stage i'll not say she is trying to derail but what is happening is most probably she has not been asked or she is not going that i don't know personally 
but uh, she has concentrated herself only on her son's seat that is Jalawar. She's putting there for last, you know, almost uh, 20 days. She's, right. she's only canvassing for her son, uh, that's Dushan Singh. Otherwise, she has not gone out of that constituency. So either the people have not asked for her in BJP or she herself is not going. That is to be seen. And with Vasundra, there was a plus point. People knew her all over the state. Right. Now you don't have a leader who is a pan-state leader to canvas, you know. That and is I'm all sure, and I'm sure because you, you yourself said that uh, Bajan Lal Sharma is a first time MLA, is a first time chief So obviously on his shoulders, BJP can it be uh, can it rest assured that it's gonna win 25 on 25 just uh, on the basis of the whatever charisma he has or whatever he is. First of all, he does not have any charisma. He has been made chief minister only three months back, you know. People have not forgotten Ashok Gelot so far. You will find in villages, if you go to villages, you will find people still talking about Ashok Gelot, his policies. And that is why if you look at the Congress manifesto, it talks about Ashok Gelot's scheme of uh, of 25 lakhs um, uh, universal health scheme. This was Ashok Gelot's baby. And he was banking to win elections on that. But he failed, ultimately. So my take is, if elections are held on the basis of caste, not on Modi's face, then obviously he uh, is going to lose some seats. For sure. For sure. Okay. So just to inform the viewers, in Rajasthan, some seats are up for grabs in the first now, overall picture. Uh, out of 543, the first phase is covered with 126. Now, let me come to the others, uh, the other participants on the panel. And I'll come to Vivek now. Vivek, uh, what does the picture look like uh, as far as the first phase of elections is concerned? Uh, do you think that there is a Modi factor? Because uh, I was just just one or two hours before we were reading Namdeep uh, Rana, who is the BJP MP, saying that there is no Modi wave this time. The BJP leaders are saying that there is no more debate. No more is what can be. Is 2024 really going to be difficult for BJP? Uh, yeah, Nilu. Uh... Uh, I, I I have seen a statement and uh, it is not exactly worded like what you have just said. She is saying that don't wait for the Modi wave or something like that. She is not explicitly saying that there is no Modi wave. Anyway, but then uh, effectively, possibly it means the same. Uh, and uh, she is asking her uh, workers to work like, you know, like, like it's a it's a panchayat election kind of. So... Uh, but that's true. I mean, uh, the Modi wave is not there, at least uh, in the first five uh, uh, constituencies which are going to poll in Vidarbha. They are like Nagpur, Ramtek, Bandara, Gundia, Garchiluri, Chimur and Chandrapur. Uh, and the buzz that is uh, going around is, you know, uh, constitution uh, and, you know, this washing machine uh, propaganda uh, unleashed by the opposition. Apart from that, unemployment and price rise. These are the four issues which are really uh, doing rounds uh, among the electorate. If you talk to people, uh, they will you will find them uh, criticizing the Modi government on uh, all these four grounds. Particularly, the constitution thing is very much uh, pronounced uh, uh, among the backward sections, Dalits uh, and Adivasis, and even among Muslims. So uh, uh, that is why perhaps you know uh, Mr. Modi chose to spoke uh, speak about constitution first time in Vidarbha when he was at uh, Kanan, a place where he addressed a rally for three constituencies together. There he was uh, first time referring to this propaganda by the opposition that uh, once the BGP comes comes back to power in 2024, the first task they will undertake is change the constitution. And he very emphatically said that this is a propaganda against us and we are not going to do anything. Uh, to that effect. And then uh, repeatedly the BJP leaders are now uh, emphasizing that there is not going to be any tinkering with the constitution. So this is the buzz that we, we are getting from uh, uh, Vidarbha. And uh, the other thing that uh, one gets to know is that the fighting is very tough and the elections are very tough for the BJP. Unlike in 2019 where it was smooth sailing, uh, even Nagpur seat is uh, not certainly you know, a walkover for uh, a person as tall as uh, Mr. Nitin Gadkari, who is the next most popular 
BJP face after Narendra Modi. So the, uh, Mr. Modi is not certainly making waves, uh, at least in Nagpur, where there is Mr. Gadkari. Uh, and even for Gadkari, the election is going to be very, very tough. That is what most of the political observers here say. Because, you know, uh, uh, there is one invisible factor, intangible factor in Maharashtra, which nobody can guess where it is going to, uh, who it is going to uh, affect. And that factor is the Maratha agitation. Uh, because there is a lot of overlap uh, between the voters of the BJP and the people who are uh, affected by this agitation. That is the Kunbis. Like for example in Nagpur. Uh, there are about 5 lakh uh, Kunbi voters in Nagpur. And the candidate uh, of the Congress party is a Kunbi himself. So uh, if, if you add up the Kunbi votes along with the Dalits, uh, the Muslims and there is another caste weaver community which is also said to be going against the BJP. It comes to something like 10 to 12 lakh votes. So that's a very sizable chunk. And if majority of them vote against um, the BJP, then Mr. Gadkari's uh, fortunes will be in doldrums. You know, uh, because uh, uh, last time the Congress had polled 4.5 lakh votes and Mr. Gadkari's margin was 2 and uh, 2 lakh 16,000. So if there's going to be an overwhelming support for the Congress candidate this time round when there is no Vanchit Bahujan Agadi, for example, in Vanchit Bahujan Agadi has expressed his support to the Congress. Uh, apart from that, Aam Admi Party has also supported the Congress. So there are many factors which are going against Mr. Gadkari, but uh, Mr. Gadkari is so popular in Nagpur just as he is popular in other parts of the country, it's very, very difficult to defeat him. But that is going to be the barometer. If Mr. Gadkari uh, fi is finding it tough in Nagpur, you can understand, you can certainly guess that the situation is not really very, very conducive for the BJP across the board, elsewhere in the country as well. So Nagpur serves as a barometer for the BJP, I believe, Nilo. Right. But uh, do you think, uh, Vivek, before I go to Girish and uh, Rajlakshmi, do you think that uh, Maharashtra is the toughest political ground for BJP at the moment? Sure. Absolutely, absolutely. You, you know, uh, what if, even if you talk to the BJP leaders, uh, some of them are very uh, clearly saying that they are not going to win, the alliance is not going to win more than 24 seats. I mean, I can't name the leader, but he's certainly one of the tallest BJP leaders and he has confided in uh, some journalists uh, that the alliance, the Mahayuti alliance, they're calling it the ruling alliance, not going to uh, get more than 24 seats, which is half the mark. The Maharashtra has 48 seats as we know. So that is uh, at least about 17, uh, 17 to 18 seats less than what they got in 2019. And uh, th that that is going to be a big uh, dent in the overall tally of the BJP alliance at the national level. So Maharashtra serves as a very, very important state uh, for both the opposition as well as uh, the ruling uh, BJP, Nilo. Uh, now I'll come to Girish. Uh, Girish, uh, what do you th how do you think uh, BJP and the opposition as well, uh, they are poised for the first phase of elections? Are we in a position to say in any way that uh, the opposition looks much more comfortable in the first phase? Uh, say, for example, in Western UP, people have been saying that there are pockets in Western UP where BJP might just simply get pulverized because of so many communities pitted against each other, the Kshatriyas, the Kisans, uh, the, the Rajputs, uh, the Jats, they're all pitted, you know, and, 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 and the sentiment is really going against BJP. So how would you see the first phase as far as the opposition and the BJP are concerned? 102 out of 543 seats. Uh, Nilu, first thing we can see, it is the repetition of 2004. See, uh, BJP did not come because of their own... Uh, propaganda or their promises or something. They came on anti-Congress votes. Now, that is the same situation. This time, uh, India Alliance comes because of the anti-BJP votes, the dissatisfaction level. Now, we are initially talking of these nine states. I'll tell you, there is they are about to lose 86 seats because almost uh, its majority of OBCs uh, is there, which is totally against them. And, uh, Allow me to interrupt pardon me? you. Allow me to interrupt you. You said that they are poised to lose 86 seats. So is this 86 yes. out of the 102 seats which are going to polls in the first phase? 
No, no. The OBC, in fact, in total, 264 seats. Of that, 86 they are missing out. The reason is the message given by India Alliance has gone very strong. That see, the intention of BJP is to privatize the things. Now, if they privatize, you are losing your reservation category. You are not getting the jobs. So that has gone very strongly. People have started telling that if you are not getting the jobs, then why are we voting for BJP? This is the first thing. Then dissatisfaction itself. If I talk of Gujarat, see now of late they have realized that initially when they want to remove somebody, they always use this uh, religious card. When they wanted to remove Anandi Ben, they again played these Patel cards for unemployment and in infighting. This time, because of the alliance, initially they used to win because AAP used to eat away votes of the uh, Congress. Now this time when they are together, they had no other option, so they instigated the Rajput their own strong men to talk something loose where Rajput and their things are getting well settled now. Their intentions are clear. They have got, they have, uh, the target is accomplished. They wanted Rajputs and Patels because they are the dominating uh, people in the uh, you know, vote banks in Gujarat. Now this is, they have forcibly asked the uh, Pursatam Rupala to stand for, which was the initial that they, he should not file the form. Now he has filled the form. Now they are told, okay, part two, we will see if he doesn't withdraw by 18, then again we will start something. But they are, this way they are diluting the stand. So wherever they are, Gujarat, you know, unemployment is not a big thing. So that doesn't catch up very strongly as it does in UP and Madhya Pradesh and everywhere. Now very new thing that they have started, but we are not able to still analyze why this has happened. Suddenly under GST, uh, they changed the norms that the small players will have to be paid within 45 days. Now that 45 days is not possible. Under that pretext, most of the textile units have closed down. Around 30,000 people from Bihar and UP who are working textile, they have left back. They have gone home. Now whether they have been inculcated not to vote for BJP in Gujarat or they are going to, uh, they are sent there to vote. Now this we'll have to wait and watch. So there are a lot of changes on the ground. Normally BJP is under impression that whatever they say, it is God's spell and everybody follows. But this time, it's everything topsy-turvy. Even the candidates out of uh, six, five have come from Congress the previous day and they have been given Vidhan Sabha re-polling election. So things are very good. We will have to just wait and see. But the 26 hope that they had is, I think, is getting tough. If Rajputs do not settle for their uh, core, then they are losing around six to seven seats. If not, if something is settled, then at least two seats, which AAP is holding in Bhavnagar and Vaj, they are going because that is a very strong hold of AAP there. Right. All right. Uh, Rajlakshmi, I'll come to you and then I'll come to Pushpraj. Rajlakshmi, how much of uh, the issue is the electoral bonds? In every interview, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is trying to justify the electoral bonds uh, to, to the level of uh, almost like challenging the Supreme Court's verdict, saying that those who are opposing will regret. And if they do an honest introspection, they will regret. This is the kind of interview, and repeatedly he's saying the same thing in all the interviews. The Tanti TV interview, then he gave an interview to ANI, he said the same thing. Uh, how big is the electoral bonds issue according to you on the ground? Well, I've been talking to people. I, I also traveled uh, to some to some constituencies in Rajasthan. I mean, my my uh, the the feedback that I got uh, I got was that that Kejriwal's that Kejriwal's arrest has has actually you know unnerved people it has uh, it has un uh, it has unnerved the aam Admi because uh, uh, and not so much the uh, the issue of electoral bonds uh, because because i think it also it also depends to what extent the opposition uh, the india the india alliance has been able to take the issue of uh, the, uh, of the corruption beh behind electoral bonds uh, to the people but uh, but uh, but more than that you know given that given that limitation apart uh, I think that the arrest of two uh, sitting chief ministers has has actually has uh, has actually affected you know the local uh, 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 in fact uh, the masses in that sense because they feel that if this can happen to uh, to such important people you know uh, it can happen to us uh, and and um, and I also felt that there was a certain you know diffidence uh, 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 among 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 the electorate to spell out their choices you know immediately but, uh, i interrupt you here a little uh, you you said that electoral bonds is not that big an issue uh, but arvind kejriwal and Heman soren's arrest is a bigger issue so does that mean that prime minister's 
repeated assertions that, you know, the corrupt people, there will be no compromise, they will be put behind the bars. Uh, it seems that that explanation by the prime minister is not cutting too much of ice on the ground. No, it's not. It's not. People uh, uh, are, in fact, you know, expressing themselves in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, joblessness, in terms of, you know, price, price. Menga is something that everybody talks about. I mean, I mean, really, doesn't re require too much of prompting at that level. And and other than that, uh, I mean, I, uh, I mean, I mean, frankly, I do not sense that 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 there's a great uh, um, uh, the the you know the the Modi effect is going to be uh, as as much as it was in the last two uh, in the last two elections, uh, and and it's also because because that the uh, because the opposition has got its act together, because the, the the fact that they have had certain seat sharing arrangements also in some states like for instance Rajasthan as uh, as a colleague was just mentioning, and uh, uh, and also in UP uh, this uh, this joint holding of you know press conferences even in Tamil Nadu. Uh, with with uh, with Mr. Stalin, uh, Rahul Gandhi, you know, he held joint press conferences and joint rallies also were held. The the Congress leaders are you know campaigning also for the India Alliance uh, India Alliance candidates. Uh, in fact, top leaders are campaigning and they are also encouraging their cadre to come out you know and vote for them also. So I think uh, I think a, a lot of things are happening you know at the ground level too. Uh, I mean, it may not maybe translate into uh, into the kind of you know transformation that 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 one might sort of expect, but 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 it is definitely not going to be. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean a sweep, a sweep, sweep. You know, in the name of Mr. Modi, as it was in the last two elections, because 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 this thing that okay, you know, the candidate doesn't matter. You know, it's you know it's actually Modi's election. You know, I mean, uh, this kind of a this kind of a narrative is not really selling. You know, it may uh, it may be, as I said, you know that 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 uh, that outwardly, you know, people in fact might not express their their views, you know, and uh, uh, and the preferences for a political party, and and uh, and it's fear that is determining that. It is fear because they see that the chief ministers have been have, uh, I mean have been sent to jail. So so this fear of expressing their opinion, uh, uh, I mean, openly is not I mean is there, but. But at the background of it, I think lies deep resentment towards what uh, towards what's actually happening. So they say that you know everybody knows you know the electoral bonds issue you know doesn't have to be spelled out because it was because it was reported uh, I think widely it was discussed widely. So this impression that that a certain party has gained you know a lot of corporate largesse uh, and um, and of course God knows you know what they did with it, but uh, it, uh, it's gone down. Now again, to what extent you know uh, if it, it will concretely translate into uh, into voter choices is is something to be seen. But you know, coupled with this, you know, the the lived lives of people, the lived realities of people. So 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 there comes the whole issue of choice. You know, people people I think will sort of make those connections, and it is for the opposition, uh, the alliance partners, to make those connections. That the. Uh, you know that here you have you know the EBS uh, whole issue, and plus you know the lived realities of people. You know you have no jobs, you're Mengai, you have uh, you, 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 I mean I, I mean people are really living uh, uh, you know, on the fringes actually, you know, right. huh? and Mengai is really important, and uh, and uh, uh, you know and uh, the, you know in fact today I was listening to the press conference, the joint press conference of the Congress and the Samajwadi Party. This whole issue about. Uh, about you know the apprenticeship act you know to ensure that every that every uh, graduate holder you know or a diploma holder gets a right to apprenticeship in in either the private okay. or the public sector i mean i mean it can uh, it can resonate because because almost like an employment guarantee you know it's almost like an employment guarantee and the uh, and uh, and the other aspect is of the uh, it, it, you know the legal guarantee for the msp of the msp of course, yes. BJP has not said that it will do that. You know, it has said that it will increase the MSP every year to year, but it has not promised a legal guarantee. It has said that it will increase the uh, PM Kisan Samanidhi, but it has not said that it will give a legal guarantee to the MSP. So, so as far as the BJP's uh, things are concerned, it is, it is, it is, I think, more or less the same as to what it had sort of promised. You know, the assurances. But here right. you have some. Uh, yeah. 
So basically, uh, BJP doesn't have a new story to tell the people in 2024. And I was looking at the newspapers, and Pushpraj, now I'll come to you. I, all the newspapers, uh, they're... Uh, the first page is the BJP manifesto, which is called the Modi Ki Guarantee. Whether it is the Hindi newspapers, whether it is the English newspapers, the first page is about the BJP manifesto, which is called Modi Ki Guarantee. Now, is this Modi's guarantee or which maybe deliberately he's tried to center everything around himself? Uh, is this really, uh, in a way, it's, it's, it's backfiring for BJP now? Too much of Modi is, is is becoming lethal for BJP, and the people also do not want an overdose of uh, Prime Minister Modi now. Uh, hi, Neeluji. I think only time will tell whether that will uh, that is actually a factor that is playing in whether it's too much Modi is now becoming a variable that is uh, that is backfiring. So I wouldn't go so far as to that. But what I can safely say is in doing that that the BJP organization, the BJP leaders have all been reduced to subsidiary props. They are simply in the corner, the manifesto, the political campaign, the poor uh, promises are now all secondary. The vision, there is no vision. The vision is all in 2047. It's now only about the prime minister. Everything else is this thing. So my the basic formulation in which they have reduced the BJP organization today, I feel that there is, an, there is going to be an election after this and there is going to be a time when Prime Minister Modi is not going to be around. The day this happens, the BJP is going to crumble like a pack of cards. It's very clear. This kind of centralized uh, uh, performative uh, focus on the Prime Minister is going to be detrimental, which is a factor that is very vocal in the BJP organization as well as the RSS. This is something that we are not really uh, sufficiently appreciating. That's the first part I want to make. The second thing I wanted to say is that uh, I have traveled about 80, 84 constituencies so far, 83, I think, 83 constituencies so far. Uh, there is a heavy anti-BJP sentiment uh, on the ground. And this is not just in the South. And uh, the internal surveys of the India party show that this is in the high 50s. Even in states like UP and Bihar, it's in the mid, uh, it's in the early 50s, sometimes the late uh, 40s. That percentage is publicly borne out by the Lokniti uh, CSDS survey, which I think all of you have seen. Not only is Ram Mandir and other cultural issues not clicking, but uh, the anti-BJP sentiment is actually quite high, enough for the India parties to capitalize on. That is one very core uh, key, key takeaway that I have seen in at least these 83 constituencies I have traveled in. And this is borne out also by the fact that there is no BJP pro-BJP buzz. Despite doing multiple core cultural issues, despite doing multiple ANI interviews, there is no buzz around the BJP campaign. In fact, I would say that in a sense, the opposition is doing a very smart thing by focusing on local issues, by making sure that the campaign is focused on the constituencies and not making this a meta narrative. Right? In that sense, the BJP is doing something very smart, I think. By understanding, by understanding that there is this anti-BJP sentiment, that there is not much of a big achievement for them to sell, what they are focusing on is a slow burn, uh, sort of a lukewarm campaign. They keep periodically inserting these core uh, cultural issues. You know, So on the papers, you will see this Ram Mandir thing. Sometimes someone is going to talk about this constitution thing. Sometimes someone else is talking about this reservation thing. So there are these core issues that sort of keep signaling to their core vote back. And my but thing is that, by and large, they've realized that the the, sec the catchment area that is going to be pro-BJP is not increasing. Mind you, this is something that we keep forgetting. The co uh, eligible voters are about 90.5 crores, right? Out of a population of 140, 138, 140 crores. Which means that BJP got only about 25.4% of the vote, which is uh, about 16.3% of the total population. That catchment area, a significant chunk in that, voted for the BJP because of development, mm -hmm. right? Which means that the core Hindutva vote bank is not more than about 12-13%. Right. Now the point is that how much can you focus on that? How much can you really rely on that core cultural issues? So they are deliberately back playing that. That is something which is very, very interesting because they are trying to avoid uh, creating a meta-narrative on core cultural issues. That's very clear. Hmm. However, having said that, I also feel that uh, what... Uh, uh, Vivek Deshpande ji was talking about uh, this Gadkari's thing. There is a there are a number of candidates, not just in Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath, 
even nitin gadkari there is a concerted effort and this is very very widely known in the bjp carta and the rss carta there is a concerted uh, uh, campaign to diminish or uh, reduce the margins of those potential contenders who could be threats to the prime minister's candidature should there be a coalition government it's very clear there is a serious serious uh, uh, cleavage between yogi adityanath and the prime minister between gadkari and this thing and there is a concerted effort by the top brass to either make sure that they don't win or to completely eliminate this now this kind of this kind of gerrymandering that they are doing internally is harming them because the uh, the bjp cadre and the rss cadre does not feel that it is any more about the bjp or their agenda or their issue they feel it's now only about the prime minister no no i mean uh, these the important and significant points which you just highlighted anil uh, i would just want to now i'm coming for the final round of questions very brief and concise but is it true are you also witnessing a phenomena in rajasthan as what i'm hearing in up that the bjp cadres have withdrawn themselves they are not stepping out of the houses uh, because of the internal dynamics and the way the tickets have been distributed uh, the cadres look very very unhappy is the picture similar in rajasthan i'll say not fully but somewhat because the ticket has been have been given you know to some of the um, congress guys now that carter is not ready to accept them now because at the last minute tickets have been given to some of the congress guys the carter mm. is not ready to work for them the a person like mahinder jit singh malviya who is fighting a election from uh, uh, baswada dungarpur constituency which is a tribal belt he just joined bjp few days you know earlier to the uh, filing of nominations i think so and this guy used to be minister in ashok gehlot uh, government so people are not liking this in the bjp cadre are not liking this because they have lost their chance of getting a ticket you know that is troubling them a, uh, a lot but unlike up there is not much you know i'll say it is simmering in some of the constituencies but not much frankly what oh, in rajasthan is happening is basically jats obs uh, jats scsts and muslims consolidating towards uh, india alliance and that is keeping their hopes alive you know how much will they win will be decided on fourth but as of today it seems that they are giving fight tough fight very tough fight at least on 12 seats you know not less than that right i'll come to you kavita now uh, uh, giving us a picture of what's happening in tamil nadu uh, no matter how hard bjp is trying or uh, you know to to make everyone believe that they are making strong inroads into the southern bastion uh, and i'm talking yeah. about uh, tamil nadu kerala as well at least they are giving a picture and a projection that you know they are trying very hard and they will be able to open the accounts this time but uh, what about the acceptability rate of bjp and even prime minister modi i mean the modi factor in 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 south india see if you remember uh, nilu last election in 2019 people uh, uh, they didn't use modi as a campaign factor you know in fact uh, the opposition leaders commented that you know uh, as long as they use modi as a campaign material it it's uh, it's to their advantage so but this time they didn't have any choice because they are not in alliance with the admk they don't have any other local leaders who have a national appeal so they decided to bring modi like for some seven times here but uh, the fact that tamil nadu as as you rightly mentioned uh, uh, bjp is not been able to uh, see i i did a story recently so the first mla of the bjp officially is uh, was elected in 96 and their mp is in 98 but since then they have not been able to make great inroads occasionally they might win some seats in alliance uh, but otherwise they have not been able to make great uh, this time the bjp very cleverly does what i call perception politics they are trying to build a narrative that they are strong that and i i think there is a need to do it because they don't have uh, alliance on their uh, side they have only smaller parties except for the pmk so two things if the bjp really believes that it can uh, crack that uh, magic and if they can really win seats they needn't have brought more for seven years here and uh, second they they feel that only prominent faces only very well known faces in all the constituencies you know all the former presidents of tamil nadu bjp uh, el murugan ponradha krishnan tamil say in south chennai all of them are former presidents or con- candidates in fact tamil say had to i mean you know she has to quit being a governor and come and contest here in south chennai so all the alliance parties have also fielded only prominent faces 
So if the BJP is very confident of winning a certain number of votes, Anamali says that he will win 20 percentage of vote share. They should, I mean, they needn't have done these two things. They needn't have brought Modi so many times or fielded prominent candidates. So I'm sure they are like worried, but they need to keep that talk alive about, you know, they, I think basically Anamali makes this very uh, controversial statements only because he hopes that it will help stay BJP in, in the spotlight. You know, that's the mm -hmm. idea basically. So That's true. at one point, both the ADMK and the DMK decided that the fight will be amongst them. So TRB Raja was on record saying he is not willing to answer any. TRB Raja is a minister from the DMK and is in charge of Coimbatore, hmm. uh, the leader in charge of Coimbatore for the DMK. So when someone asked about anomaly statements, Raja said, you know, I don't want to talk about the BJP because they are not the prime opposition. They are not our opposition. Hmm. So I think uh, anomaly basically has to do these things because he wants to keep the party in the limelight. You know, and the, he wants to keep some kind of talk buzz around the party. Otherwise, right. I don't. I don't really see things improving for them. Right. I'll just take a cue from uh, a particular sentence which you said that BJP is doing perception politics, but that was South. Yeah. You're talking about Tamil Nadu. Uh, Rajalakshmi, I'll come to you. Isn't BJP doing this? Uh, you know, almost <laughs> like Pan India. If the sentiment on the ground is against BJP, where people are worried more about price rise and uh, you know, inflation, jobs, uh, and the kind of uh, narrative which BJP is trying to portray, the Modi ki guarantee, and we'll do this, we'll do that. They are showing a mirror for 2047. And obviously, people, people, it seems that they are not, they are in no mood to be bluffed this time for BJP. So is BJP, entire campaign of BJP, is, is it looking like a very hollow politics this time in 2024? Uh, is it looking like what, Nilu? Can you just come again? Because I'm a, hollow the politics, a very hollow kind of a politics. Absolutely, no, no, absolutely, Nilu. Because uh, because I don't think they have you know much to really offer, uh, you know. Because I think given the kind of uh, uh, because I'm sure they would have done surveys and would have sort of assessed you know people's sentiment uh, towards towards them, and they uh, and that is why you know all these guarantees are being uh, are being talked about because. Because the party knows that in the last 10 years, it has not really done much. Of course, it can say that, you know, before us, you know, the Congress was responsible, you know, for the mess and that we had, uh, in fact, very little time to to undo all that, uh, all that. And, uh, you know, therefore, uh, therefore, you have to give us, you know, another term to do it. But, 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 but the fact is that every election is about, you know, Tom Tomming, you know, the smallest of achievements. In fact, I wouldn't even call them, you know, achievements, where if you look at the kind of the the kind of you know vast gaps you know of inequalities that's, that still exist in a country right and and it's not just it's not just you know just uh, just a thing you know that economists are saying i mean it is as i said in the lived the lived realities of people you know the day to day realities of people and uh, and it is there i think they have i think lost out the uh, they have lost the plot therefore they have to bring all this you know the sanatan dharma uh, thing comes into picture. They they would again, you know, go back and forth about Ram Temple. They would say that, you know, that in Tamil Nadu, you know, the uh, these parties, the the dividend parties, do not respect culture. They do not know anything about Tamil culture, and that they know about Tamil culture, and that BJP is, you know, the repository of uh, of uh, of Indian culture in that sense. So they so they keep on, you know, harking. Uh, I mean, harking and falling back to that again about you know dynastic politics. So the same tropes are being used. The same ropes are being used. The same tropes are being used. They they actually do not have anything much to offer. They do not have anything much to offer in terms of new campaigners. Also, it it is right. it is the same face. It's the same figure and the right. same kind of a style of you know appealing to people. And I think there is some fatigue here. You know, some some fatigue has set in and uh, uh and and again as i said to what extent it gets you know capitalized on you know depends a lot by the opposition alliance not only in the form of uh, uh outwardly expressions you know of coming together but 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 they have to do a lot of you know mobilization on ground and i think to an extent it is happening it is not that it's not happening and ultimately the people as i said you know because because they they also sort of read and they also know about what's happening so right. so, uh, so in fact in fact it's very interesting there was one there was a BJP Karakarta who told me that 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 as long as you know Kejriwal stays inside, you know, the BJP has no chance of winning a single seat in Delhi. And that but if he comes out, you know, they might they might still win one or two seats. So it is, it is so it is in the part, you know, it is in their interest that he actually come out. 
but but as long as he stays inside this in the the so this sympathy that is there amongst people you know because for instance the amavi party is not contesting in rajasthan it is not so all its all its support base is going to go to the opposition alliance so so here at that level there has been a certain consolidation of uh, of the opposition alliance uh, you know the india alliance in that sense because because there has been seat sharing and plus there has been this understanding that we shall transfer our our support base to to our you know candidates you know for instance, wherever there's wherever they are in some places there's there are friendly contests and that can't be avoided but there is this understanding that that this is going to be the case so exactly i mean cumulatively if you see that there is a consolidation of the india alliance votes pushpraj i'll come to you now uh, obviously india alliance has been working and working behind the scenes a lot rather than making noise that is very very evident but what about the common minimum agenda are we going to expect that uh, because the first phase of elections is starting day after tomorrow and uh, when do we expect uh, that to happen among a common minimum agenda shouldn't that have come out earlier thanks nilu ji <laughs> uh, so i can't really talk about it much uh, being involved in it a bit but uh, i know that most of the manifestos have some common issues these have been fleshed out uh, in previous meetings in bombay and uh, in mumbai and uh, in delhi so there is some kind of synergy already between the manifestos and uh, i think indian express has done a report yesterday or today i can't remember which uh, which shows those uh, comparisons there are efforts to uh, publicly uh, project those commonalities uh, should happen in the next few days i think um, but the risk the very serious risk there is the minute you start talking about india ki guarantee or india's guarantee and so on and so forth you are going to nationalize the campaign uh, and risk a direct front fight so those right. those variables are being considered very closely and i think that the next uh, i mean today tomorrow we should close i mean they will close that issue and i think that uh, if all goes well by next week you may have a, a formal projection on that particular count but as i said this issue is this election is no longer about the meta narratives it is about local issues about the candidates uh, and i think there is a very conscious decision that every india party is making to avoid making this into a meta narrative because they have sections of the media with them they have a war chest with not just the electoral bonds but the other things they can out maneuver the india parties the minute you focus on national issues having recognized recognizing that they are trying to make it a gorilla campaign by chipping away at the edges as a uh, uh, our uh, one of our co panelists from rajasthan said if 5 to 7 you are chip you are chip you are able to chip away from rajasthan similarly about 10 seats from uh, from bihar similarly about 15 well 12 to 15 seats from karnataka and so on and so forth you are actually chipping away their margin is right now 33 about 272 the bjp's if you are able to getting them below 30 40 is very easy if you are able to limit them to 50 60 by chipping away at these margins then you have put them into serious trouble which is why anticipating that the bjp is actually sabotaging any potential uh, threats uh, or uh, 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 candidates against prime minister modi so the yeah. nagpur election is is a close call because the bjp internally is sabotaging the gadkari i'm going to say bjp i mean the modi the modi is bjp the modi faction so all those variables we have to also factor in now i personally feel that there is a lot going for the india alliance it just remains for these local candidates and the party organizations to get their act together um so i can at best right now i can speculate that it seems to be clear but i wouldn't go so far as to say that it's a uh, it's a done deal because it's just phase 1 that i mean the way they have drawn out this election is six seven more phases so we'll wait and watch i'm going to be cautiously optimistic right now okay okay so uh, you you being cautiously optimistic and uh, vivek uh, so towards the end can i ask you what are the other surprises which we can expect because it's just the first phase which is going to begin day after tomorrow are we going to see some more surprises from bjp's end of course pm's interviews of course there will be uh, a lot many interviews he has planned up and uh, a lot of issues new issues might come up what, what do you think is going to happen over the next seven phases <laughs> 
yeah, Nilo, definitely there will be some surprises, uh, something which we cannot imagine. I mean, BJP, BJP, BJP's imagination, Mr. Modi's imagination is really very wild. It's so wild that you, you cannot match uh, their imagination with yours. And it's very difficult to make any guess about what they can do. So they can go to an extent. If Mr. Modi gets a sense in the middle of the elections that he is going to lose this election badly, then you don't know what he can do. I mean, I can I can refer to a statement of his in one of those interviews recently, the uh, last two three days. He said that the international situation is uh, um, such that you know India needs a very strong uh, government. So uh, does that mean that uh, if in the middle of these elections, if he gets a sense of uh, losing the election finally or not mustering a majority, does it mean that he will do something uh, along the lines? which we have seen, which we witnessed in uh, 1975, because that is exactly what uh, Mrs. Gandhi was also saying prior to uh, imposing emergency. So is Mr. Modi hinting at that? I mean, you, you, you don't know what Mr. Modi is capable of doing. He can do anything, but he will not, he will not quit power uh, even if he is losing. That is something for sure. So to retain power, whatever he does, whether he, I mean, there's, there's nothing constitutional about what the BJP does. Somebody very interestingly said to me recently that when Mr. Modi first time touched uh, his head on the floor of the um, parliament, uh, that, that, you know, I was reminded of Nathuram Gudse who touched Mahatma Gandhi's feet and then shot him. So, Mr. Modi, uh, that was perhaps beginning of uh, parliamentary, uh, end of the parliamentary democracy, uh, in India. I mean, that is how he tried to connect the two uh, things. So, uh, Mr. Modi can't do anything. I cannot make any guess about it. But one thing is for sure that too much of dependence of Mr. on Mr. Modi and too much of dependence on the Hindutva issue will cost uh, the BJP very dearly because the two issues have really plateaued. They have stopped yeah. resonating more than what they uh, are capable of uh, with the masses. And the people I have now started thinking beyond Hindutva and thinking beyond Mr. Modi. And that is exactly what is going to be there and doing. People have started thinking about inflation. People have started thinking about constitution being uh, changed. People have started thinking about unemployment. So the real issues have started uh, coming up uh, on the minds of the people. And that is exactly where the BJP has got the people wrong. They thought that Mr. Modi's persona and uh, the Hindutva narrative will uh, keep, keep mesmerizing the people all the time, and that is not going to happen. That is the pro that is the problem that BJP is facing. But it's too late in the day. How are they going to uh, make up for it? I I can't make any guess. But they will not. Mr. Modi will not quit power so easily, even if he loses it. That's that's all I can say, Nilo. But I guess uh, it's time now for BJP to introspect the shelf life of Hindutva and those emotive issues is almost getting over because people have started questioning the ruling dispensation on price rise, inflation, jobs. And of course, here you have a prime minister who is defending the indefensible. He goes around and says that people who are opposing electoral bonds will have to regret. And that is something which has been declared as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So what Prime Minister Modi is capable of doing in the next seven phases is a very difficult guess right now. But yes, it's an eye-opening moment for the people and for the country. So we'll have to wait and watch as to what's going to ha happen over the next few weeks, which we will witness in India's history. Thank you so much, uh, Pushpraj Deshpande, TK Raj Lakshmi, Kavita, Anil, Vivek. Thank you so much for joining and one appeal to the viewers who are watching this discussion, subscribe to our channel, send us your feedback and stay tuned to The Federal. Thank you. Subscribe to The Federal's YouTube page for more news and updates.